So my name's Richard Measures. I work for NIWA in Christchurch. I've been at NIWA for about 12 years. Um, so I did a degree in originally in, in civil engineering, and then I worked in flood modeling, uh, flood hydrology, flood options design in the UK for about six years before coming out to NIWA, shortly before the Christchurch earthquake. Um, and since I've been at NIWA, I've done a lot of work on the, on the Buller River, as well as other rivers around New Zealand, looking at kind of sediment transport in rivers, uh, flood forecasting, um, kind of bank erosion, all, all basically science around rivers and, and um, river flooding. So what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to go through just some of the, the kind of the mechanisms that caused the flooding in the July 2021 event, some of the weather mechanisms, rainfall, um, the flow measurement that NIWA did during the event, and then our understanding of the flow history on the Buller River and the, the flood frequency, the return period of different flood events. Um, I'm also going to talk about climate change, um, what that has resulted in terms of the historic change we've seen up to now, changes in sea level, changes in rainfall and river flow, and also some of the future changes we expect to see. So this is just starting to look at some of the mechanisms causing that flooding event in July. Um, the slide here is showing moisture anomaly, so the green is, is wet. Um, the blue is dry, and what you can see is that kind of long band of, of moisture coming in, what we call an atmospheric river, and that's about 4,000 kilometres long. And, and the really noticeable thing during this event is that it kind of hit one point on the west coast. It didn't move around, so that, that moisture is just coming into the Buller catchment continuously for sort of two, three days in that one spot. It's like a fire hose kind of pointing at the whole catchment, bringing moisture in. What you're looking at here is a plot and it's showing the whole world and it's integrated vapour transport. So that's the amount of water vapour that's in the atmosphere being transported. Um, so it's like tonnes per second per metre width is kind of the units. Um, and that's, that's showing this, if we zoom into where the, the red circle is, you can see basically this sort of fire hose atmospheric ripper pointing towards Westport. Now that's the July 2021 event. And what I want to show you here is just the same mechanism occurred in the 1950 flood and the 1970 flood that, that Matt's mentioned previously. So you can see it's, it's a really similar mechanism. So this is the, this is the process which is causing flooding in, that, in the, those big floods in the Buller catchment, is this atmospheric river coming in. So the point I want to make here is just how big the Buller catchment is. So this is, you know, the, the, to, to cause flooding in Westport, you've got to have rainfall stretching all the way from Lewis Pass across to St Arnold and, and to Westport. It's 5,000 square kilometres. Um, and, and basically it's, it's rain across that whole period. And because the catchment is so big, it requires rain of a roughly sort of two to three days. It's got to keep falling for that amount of time across the whole catchment. And that's what generates those really big floods. If we get sort of six hours of, of really intense rain in Westport, that's not going to cause flooding in the Buller River because it's not long enough and it's not coming a big, big enough area. Um, the other thing you can see on this plot is just the, um, the locations of all the different monitoring infrastructure. So there's a whole bunch of rain gauges spread out across the catchment. And then we've got sort of five or six river flow monitoring gauges. And the, the most important of those is Buller at Takuha, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute. So what we're looking at here is observed rainfall during the July 2021 event, 48-hour um, rainfall accumulations. And the, the dark purple areas are rainfall in excess of 200 millimetres. And you can see that's really covering that, that whole area from Westport across to Lewis Pass and up to St Arnold. And that's why we got this really big flood during that event. So during the event, um, one of our guys in, in, based in Greymouth, who has a field team in Greymouth, Mike O'Driscoll, managed to get up to Westport before the roads closed. And he was actually on site during the flood, taking the best measurements that we could of what the flow was during the, during the peak of the flood. Um, and obviously, Takuha is quite remote. It's in the gorge. It's very difficult to safely take measurements there. So he was working off the bridges in Westport. And he's using what we call a surface velocity radar. It's kind of like a speed gun that a, that a, a, a traffic cop would use to measure, to measure the speed of cars. He's using it to measure the speed of the, the river surface. And then we went back afterwards and we measured the bed levels. And between the speed of the water and the depth of the water, we can get a flow measurement. So he was doing that on both bridges during the flood, the bridge over the Oruwaiti on the Karamea Highway and the main highway into Westport. So we sort of backwards and forwards between the between the two bridges as the flood approached. 
And that's really important, that flow data, because it, it provides a, a direct measurement that we can use to, to benchmark the, the flows recorded at Takuha by the automated gauge, and also that we can use in the hydrodynamic hydro modeling to make sure that the model is accurately reproducing what occurred during the event. So that Takuha flow recorder, it's upstream of the Westport. It's kind of um, in, the, in the lower Buller Gorge. Um, you wouldn't see it if you're driving past the road because it's sort of hidden in the trees. There's not much to see. But it's been there since 1963. So one of the great things is we've got this really long record, um, continuous record flow every 15 minutes since 1963. There is some earlier data as well from predecessor sites. There was a site at Berlin's uh, installed in the early 1950s. And then prior to that, there's sort of anecdotal records. To Kuha, there's both NIWA and West Coast Regional Council instruments there, and that's to provide sort of backup resilience during floods. Um, and just the, the data is being put to slightly different uses. NIWA is using it for research, West Coast Regional Council is using it for, for flood forecasting and flood management. So this is the recorder site. Um, and you can see just what I've shown there with the blue line is the, the height of the flood water during that July 2021 event. So the, the flood water in this picture was taken a couple of days after the flood. It's about four meters. During that 2021 event, it peaked at 12.8 meters. So a massive increase in level, um, just because it's, it's in that quite narrow gorge there. Uh, and, and basically the, the site, it records the water level, and then we have a relationship between water level and flow, so we can calculate what the, what the flow was during that event. So now we're just looking at the, um, the maximum flow that was recorded each year since 1963. So since that, that flow recorder's been there in Takuha. And I guess the point I wanted to make is that the, the Buller River floods a lot. You know, the, the 2021 flood was the biggest that we've seen for a long time, but there were big floods in 1970, um, 1950, and then, but then we've, we've got all these other smaller floods as well. And I guess we, we had the one in February, 2022, and before that there was the, the 2012 flood. And this is just the same plot, but going back to some of that earlier data, and we can see some of those earlier really big floods, but we only have sort of vague estimates of what the flow was in those events. So that's the, the 1926 flood, which we know had levels higher than the July 2021 flood. So that's kind of the biggest flood that we have really a flow estimate for, and also the 1950 flood. To try and estimate return periods from, from flood history, is, is challenging. And really what, what hydrologists are trying to do there is they're looking at that, that history of data and, and the longer the record you have, the more certainty you have. And you're saying how frequently do these different floods of different sizes occur sort of statistically on the record. And we can do that analysis and we find these, these average recurrence intervals or average annual exceedance probabilities of different events. And what that means is so a, a one in 100 year event has a 1% chance of being exceeded in any given year. So that doesn't mean that just because we've had a one in a hundred year event, we're not gonna get another one the next year. It's, it doesn't mean that, but it just means in any given year, that's the probability of that flow or a bigger flow happening. And what we can say from that flood frequency analysis is that that, that July event was kind of between a 50 and 100 year event. And because the uncertainties in the measurements and the uncertainties in the flood frequency analysis, there's not much more point in trying to be more specific than that. So we'd say between a 50 year event and a 100 year event. Um, so just now looking to some of the data that was collected after the flood. So after the flood, it's really important to, after any big flood, it's really important to go and collect information about how high the flood levels got uh, and what that is important for is, um, is so we can calibrate models of the river behavior. So we, when we're looking at flood defense options, for example, we can have confidence that the model accurately predicted what happened in the July event. It accurately predicted how high the flood levels got. So to collect this data um, immediately after the flood, so, so the flood levels come up and the water's dirty, it's got lots of you know, debris in it, sticks, wood chips, um, bits of plastic, floating in the flood water, and as it, as it reaches the, the highest level it gets to and then starts to recede, it leaves a mark. And you'll find in some areas there'll be plastic bags in trees or there'll be sort of brown lines on the paintwork of a fence. So what we do is after the flood, we go around and we look for all those marks and we survey the location of those marks, how far did the flood water get, and we survey the level of those marks. So immediately after the flood event, Chris Cole and his team started collecting data around the town. And then a couple of days later, 
Uh, me and, and some other guys from NIWA went out there and worked with Chris, and we kind of collected data up into the catchment. So trying to get not just in the town where the impacts were, but also the route the flood water was taking to get to the town. So we get data capturing where the flood water got to kind of in the pathways of flooding towards the town. Um, so this is just an example of that data. The, the blue spots and the, and the numbers show the, the level of the flooding, so meters, um, meters above sea level. And then the, the blue areas in the background is a flood map that we've created from that data by taking those flood levels and, and propagating that onto the, the LIDAR-derived um, floodplain elevation to get a flood depth. So, so it's basically that the blue points are the hard data that we actually surveyed in the field, and then the, the flood map has been um, created from that data. And this is just a, a, a picture of that whole flood map. So you can see the flood mechanism there coming all the way from where the Buller River comes out the gorge, round down the Oroiti and round into town, as well as um, into, you know, into the, the harbour and all the areas near the mouth of the river. Um, so we, we got data kind of all over that floodplain. And this is, this is probably one of the best quality flood level data sets that's, that's been collected, certainly for the Buller River, um, but, but probably of most places in New Zealand. This is a really high quality data set. OK, so now I'm just going to talk about some of the changes that have affected the catchment from the point of view of, of climate change. So sea level rise and changes affecting weather and rainfall. Um, if we look at sea level rise first, what I've done here is I've I've pulled together a bunch of, of sea level data just to give a perspective on what's happened historically up to now. So if we, if we look nationally, we've got some really long records, kind of the, the closest to Westport is probably looking at data from Littleton and from Wellington. Both of those sites, we've got around 100 years of, of sea level record, of observed measured sea level. Um, there's also some more local data available from Westport Harbour that the, the Harbour Master runs and from Charleston, which is a site that NIWA ran and is now run by sort of G GNS and, and LINS. Um, and that more local data, it doesn't have as long a record and it's not quite as reliable. It's got some gaps and things, but it, it provides the local context. So what I've done here is, is this is all of the different um, sea level records overlaid. So I've taken, you know, at each of those sites, they record the sea level every one minute or five minutes or 15 minutes. So it's this continuous record through time. I've simply taken that data and taken the average for each year. So if we look at 2021, what was the mean sea level at Littleton for that year? Um, and I've, they're all collected on different vertical datums. So I've kind of collapsed them so that zero represents what the mean sea level was in the year 2000. But it's, it's a bit difficult to see what's going on because they're all on top of each other. So on the next slide, I've just spaced them out vertically so you can kind of see the trend because that's what we're interested in is, is how is the sea level changing over time? If we start by looking at uh, Wellington and Littleton, so that's the orange line and the blue line, we can see there's this really clear kind of gradually increasing trend um, of sea level. Um, and, and we can see that same trend is visible in the, the Westport data and the Charleston data. Now, the Charleston data is very noisy. You can see there's some big spikes there, and that's probably a little bit unreliable. Looking at the Westport data, it kind of, the, the pattern of year-to-year -year variability matches quite closely to what we see at Littleton and Wellington. So that data is probably reasonably reliable, although it's showing a slightly steeper rise rate. So if I put just the, the trend lines fitted to the data, you can kind of see that, um, that Westport is rising more steeply than Wellington or Littleton. And, and that suggests that there's some local effects, so some land substance going on, which is um, changing the rate of sea level rise locally. Now, it might just be affecting the gauge on the pier, so we just need to be a little bit cautious how we use that. But I guess the, the main message here is we're seeing that same trend that we're seeing in Littleton and Wellington. And if we focus in just on the more recent period, so just the last sort of 20 years or so, we can see that the rise rate, you know, again, looking at those long records from Littleton and Wellington, the rate of rise of sea level has increased over the last 20 years compared to the, the earlier period. And that's what we expect from, from climate change. That's what all the climate change models are seeing us. And that's being reflected in the observed data. You know, sea level rise isn't something that's happening, going to happen in the future. This is something that we've measured now, and we're starting to see that rise rate accelerate, which is what the the models are predicting. 
And I guess the message there is, is when we're considering the flood that happened in, in 2021 and we're comparing that to floods in the past, is that we'd expect uh, worse inundation from the 2021 event because it's happening with that higher sea level. So what Matt Gardner from Land River Sea has done here is he's run, using his flood model, he's run a simulation of the July 2021 event, but with the 1926 sea level. So how would, how bad would that flooding have been if the sea level hadn't risen? And we can see it makes about 100 mil difference, which is, which is significant but not huge. But in some areas, such as um, up kind of where there was a bit of overtopping over the railway embankment, that 100 mil is the difference between it overtopping and it not. So that's you know, a whole bunch of houses there that wouldn't have flooded if the sea level hadn't risen over the last 100 years. So we're now going to move on to looking at the effect of climate change on rainfall. Um, and, and really, we're focusing on sort of severe rainfall of the, the type of rainfall that's going to cause cause flooding. And the mechanism we're thinking there is that the air is warming, the Tasman Sea is warming, um, and, and warm air carries more moisture. Um, you know, warm sea has more energy to cause evaporation, warm air carries more moisture. The scientists are predicting increased warming in the future. Kind of what does this mean for, for flood risk? So what does the, you know, what is the influence of climate change on river flow? So there's been a few bits of science done over the last year trying to, trying to drill down in, into this for Westport. And they basically looked at what, would, what is the expected effect of, of, of the warmer atmosphere on the rainfall, and then what does that mean for river flooding? So there's a couple of bits of science done in the last year looking at the effect of climate change on river flow. So one of those is, is what we call sort of climate change attribution science, and that's trying to investigate what is the role of climate change in an observed extreme event? So in this case, the July 2021 event, how much of that severe rainfall that we experience is kind of attributable to climate change? And they do that using computer models, kind of the, the same weather event, but with, with different climate change going on. And what that shows is that the rainfall in July is about 10% higher as a result of climate change than it would have been without climate change. So, so that the, the rainfall which caused that July flooding was 10% bigger as a result of climate change. If we turn that around and look at, the other, look at it the other way, which is kind of what do we expect the future impact of, of climate change to be and, and how does that affect sort of the design event, so the, the one in 100 year event. And what that's showing is, is depending, on, um, depending on greenhouse gas emissions into the future, different, different scenarios of that, we're looking at about another sort of 9 to 19% increase on rainfall, sort of that 48-hour, that 100-year return period rainfall. That's kind of what's causing the, the flooding in the Buller. But because there's a non-linear relationship between rainfall and river flow, that's about an 11 to 25% increase in river flow. So sort of, you know, roughly 1 in 10 to 1 in 4, so a, a tenth or a quarter extra water in the river as a result of, of future climate change. And the, the references are on the slide if you want to look at this science in more detail. The other impact of that increased rainfall and increased river flow is that it causes more sediment generation in the catchments. You've got you know, more landslides, more runoff into the rivers. So that has an effect on um, gravel buildup in the river. And, you know, there's been a lot less science ar around this, but, but that's just something to be aware of, is, is that the changing rainfall is going to change some of those, those sediment balance processes that might mean there's a bit more gravel coming down, and that might change the riverbed levels as well.